everybody. Um, I'm Melina and I'm from Black Lives Matter Los Angeles. Welcome to This Is Not A Drill. And we actually thought that this was gonna be an in-person conversation, but even though Akila Shirelles is in town, we are not sitting next to each other. Um, we're still gonna have a really um, important conversation. A lot of folks have heard about reimagining public safety. And there's a lot of question around what that means. What does reimagining public safety means, mean? And um, there's been a lot of appropriation of the term. So you have elected officials and even police talking about reimagining. But there is an origin story to this term, to the term reimagining. And um, my guest tonight, our guest tonight, um, is Akila Shirils, who is one of the most brilliant folks I know, one of the most imaginative folks I know, who has been in Black freedom work for decades um, as a peace activist, a peace organizer, a peacemaker from Watts Hill. You can't have a conversation without Akila, um, without him telling you that he is from Jordan Downs. Um, from Watts and proudly represents Watts and has been doing this work on the ground of building peace um, since he was a very young man. He's still a young man, um, but since he was a very young man, he's been doing this work. And um, I always say, especially when I see people appropriating the term and using it incorrectly, that's my best friend's term, right? So. Police don't get to steal that term. Elected officials don't get to steal that term. That term actually comes from the movement and comes from my best friend, Akila Shirill. So you're not gonna take that term without um, knowing what it means and without acknowledging its origins. And so This Is Not a Drill is um, a series that some of you have been watching each and every week where we talk about what's happening with black people um, why we're in a state of emergency. We began um, by talking about the COVID-19 crisis, but we also know that when we think about the health pandemic that we're currently experiencing and the economic fallout that comes with it, solutions um, are multifaceted. And so we have to get to the real underlying condition that um, has meant Black people are suffering in terms of health, in terms of economics, in terms of um, you know where we stand on virtually every social, political, and economic measure, that we understand that the real underlying condition is the underlying condition of racism. And so as we talk about ushering in a world that is free for Black people to live and grow and step into our fullest selves, um, we're talking about transforming things and using our radical imaginings to do so. And so we're opening today in um, honor of those black, black folks who radically imagined the world, beginning with Mama Asada Shakur, whose birthday it is today. So we are absolutely opening in her name and praying that she hears us all the way down in Cuba. If y'all know her, get word to her that we love her, we appreciate her, and we're inspired by her. And then also our um, verbal libation, right? So we're also lifting up great artists and imaginers, right? Um, those who um, have walked before us like Octavia Butler, like Maya Angelou, like um, Toni Morrison, like James Baldwin, um, like Cedric Robinson, um, like uh, so many others, Paul Robeson, and we are lifting them up and asking that they be here in this space and that their radical imaginings be made manifest through our work, that we honor them with our work. Are there names that you'd like to call out, Akila? Yes, I'd like to call out um, you know, just some of the people who have been such profound influences in my life. Um, you know, I like to call out, you know, James Baldwin. Um, I like to call out, you know, um, my, my grandmother, you know, Carrie Charleston, you know, my dad, James Shirelles. Um, you know, the, these people were super influential in my life. Their DNA, you know, it's in my bones. Um, you know, uh, Malcolm X, 
um, you know, the great Amiri Baraka, you know, um, all of these individuals have been uh, just profound teachers and, um, and influencers in my life. And, and I feel like I've benefited, you know, from their, um, you know, from their, their legacy and from their being here. Ashe, Ashe. So I want to open it up. And again, I've said it, but for the sake of full disclosure, Akila is one of my best friends in the whole world. He's my bestie. And I'm <laughs> sad that you're in another room, but we will be in the oh, same space. Oh, yeah. What you say tomorrow? You yes. coming through tomorrow? I'm coming through tomorrow, and then we'll have the opportunity to be together on Saturday. So, right. yes. Yes. So I'm always happy when you're in LA. Um, so I know a lot about you, but so it's kind of weird, right, for me to be asking you questions that I already know. But can you um, begin just by grounding us in who you are? Right, who you are, where you're from, and how that's um, informed your work. Well, thank you so much, Melina. Um, you know, for um, the invitation um, to come on um, on the show. I, you know, you are like you know one of my favorite people on the planet. Um, you know, uh, my daughters, you know, and, and kids, you know, we all call you the leader of the free world. You know. <laughs> Um, you know, we, we've been in the trenches and on the front line for 30 years, you know, even though we're on the front line. Uh, I'm still 29, <laughs> homie. 30 years. That's before I was born. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's absolutely, you know, because after you look like you're 22, you know. All right. That's I'm why like, you're my best friend. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I am, um, you know, um, was, you know, raised in the Jordan Down Housing Projects, you know, I'm a project baby from Watts, um, you know, um, witnessed things, you know, growing up in the 80s that no child should ever be subject to. Um, I, I watched, you know, the crack cocaine trade blow through our neighborhood like Hurricane Katrina, destroying families and uprooting, um, you know, in, entire like communities. Um, and, um, it was horrific to experience. I mean, um, but I was, I was, I was fortunate, you know, uh, the youngest of 10 kids, um, Wajia's kids, you know, um, and, you know, not having much material possessions, but what we didn't have materially, we made up with our imagination. Um, in, um, uh, I participated in what many social justice activists call the longest running war in the history of this country, which is urban street gang wars. You know, um, that in L.A. County alone between 1983 and 2003, there were over 30,000 gang related deaths. Didn't include um, those who were permanently maimed or incarcerated for the rest of their life behind their participation. Um, major public health, um, mental health epidemic, but because many of its victims and, um, and, and perpetrators were, um, you know, young black and brown youth and young adults, our cries for help, you know, literally fell on deaf ears. I mean, we, we live in a system that is built on uh, systemic racism and implicit bias. Um, labels like gangs that we didn't give ourselves were meant to dehumanize us and desensitize the, pop, the, the, the public to our plight. Um, and, um, you, know, um, I've, I've, you know, I've, you know, had the fortune of, um, of participating and organizing the peace treaty between the Crips and Bloods in the neighborhood in 1992 changed the quality of life in the, in, in the neighborhood, um, and, and then co-founded an organization with Hall of Fame great Jim Brown and Mary I Can, um, and taking it to, you know, uh, multiple cities across the country before the advent of social media. So, you know, organizations that we now know as Cure Violence, um, that's headed up by, you know, Dr. Gary Slutkin, or um, the National Network for Safe Communities, that's headed up by David Kennedy. Um, you know, this work had already happened um, um, and it was led by, led by impacted people um, in multiple cities across the country. And, um, but today, you know, a lot of those movements are now headed up by academics. They're heavily funded. Um, and, and in many cases, um, individuals who are practitioners um, who, whose lived experience have been um, appropriated in, um, and, and, you know, our black intellectual capital basically has been just taken and, and used to, um, to develop, to design strategies all across the country um, to try to reduce violence and, and crime in urban centers um, across the country. Um, I, I've, you know, remained a practitioner and at work, um, 
my, you know, my commitment is, is, you know, is, is to black folks, man. It's like, because the number one cause of, 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 of death, you know, for, for young black men is, um, is by firearm. And, um, and I think that, you know, um, it's by design, unfortunately. And I believe that we're the only ones that can actually bring, you know, solution to it. Um, and, and I'll, 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 you know, uh, like kind of wrap my story with this so that we could have this kind of this dialogue is that, that, you know, I was fortunate to go to college and have a transformative experience. You know, some people might know this about my story. It's my inspiration. It was the thing that kind of um, inspired me to do this work is that um, in college, I met a woman who held an intentional space for me and allowed me to share with her that I was sexually abused as a kid. That was my transformative moment. When I first spoke those words, I, it, you know, I was transported back to that place when I was in the third grade, um, promising myself that I would never share with anyone that, that I had this experience. But um, you know, um, it, it, it caused me to ask um, a deeper question. I, I realized I never questioned any of the violence I saw happening in the neighborhood um, because it ultimately meant to, 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 um, to question the violence that I experienced in my own home and I didn't have language um, or courage to confront the perpetrator. But, um, you know, um, Johnny Scott, you know, um, legendary professor in the Pan-African Studies Department at Cal State Northridge, um, still my mentor and, and friend today, who grew up in the Jordan Down Housing Projects as well, um, forced me to read. Um, I read the autobiography of Malcolm X, um, Man Child in the Promised Land. Um, I read The Evidence of Things Not Seen by James Baldwin. Those books politicized me. They gave me courage. Um, and, um, and through that, uh, that lens, I was able to ask why did no one save me? And then I was also able, um, given a, um, a macro understanding of, of the violence that was happening in the neighborhood, that it, it, it didn't begin with us, that, that just like the abuse, you know, it was a tool of colonization that was meant to take away the voice and shame us into silence. And, and so for, for 30 years at this particular point, I've been working to, um, to, uh, to transform you know, um, you know, both uh, individuals and, and communities who have been um, you know, subjected to um, this level of colonization and, um, and you know, have, had a, have had a tremendous amount of success you know, and failure um, because failure is a prerequisite for success. And, um, and, and I'm just happy to be here to, you know, um, to tell you about you know, some, of, um, some of the work that we're doing um, and, and, and talk, you know, more in depth about what it means to reimagine, um, you know, public safety, because, you know, imagination is one uh, of the, of the trinity of divine law, you know, um, imagination, inspiration, and intuition, you know, this, this is a part of divine law. And, um, you know, there was, there was a, there was an inspiration that, that essentially came out of the, the organizing of the original peace treaty in Watts, that was um, truly a spiritual um, a movement. I mean, we were literally given a vision. Um, the four ma major housing projects in Watts sitting on a perfect 90 degree angle, the hypotenuse running from Nickerson Gardens to Jordan Downs. And, and, and the idea was that if we bought those two neighborhoods together, you know, the Bonnie Hunters and Grape Street, we would create a domino effect for peace across the city. And we saw it come to pass. So, you know, um, you know this work is extremely spiritual to me. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I give all praise and, 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 uh, you know, to, to, to spirit, you know, for, for guiding me and, um, for being, um, for amplifying my intuitive voice so that I could follow, um, her path. So, yes. I say, I say. And when we first, um, when I first met you, um, we were really young organizers, right? We were in our, I was in my early 20s, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and you were talking like this though already right in your yeah. 20s you were talking like this and one of the things that you always lifted up is what you just said that um, black people have to create our own solutions right yeah. mm -hmm. and those solutions are not dependent or reliant on police That's that right. those solutions are dependent and reliant on making sure that we build strong communities mm -hmm. and that we have, um, we, 
reclaim our connections to each other. I remember you real early on introducing me to um, uh, the work. You didn't introduce me to him, but introduced me to the work of Orlin Bishop, who was your other best friend at the time. Absolutely. Um, and really talking about the importance of doing the spiritual work that's necessary to transform ourselves and transform communities in the process. Um, and I just thought, you know, what a powerful way to move. Mm -hmm. And um, I knew early on about your own transformation. Mm -hmm. um, and then we stayed in touch and did a lot of work together on Watts. And if Mama Paula is watching, I hope she yeah. is. Um, I'm always indebted to her because where mm -hmm. we met, Paula Minor um, is um, one of those unsung heroes. That's who right. Just quietly did visionary work in Watts, Youth Opportunities Program in Watts, um, right. allowed us to build programs where we said, um, I know when I was with LA Youth at Work, we said, um, you know, what's happening in communities is because our community members don't have alternatives. And so she funneled through public money so we could pay people to come and be a part of our program, pay them. Now people gonna go, why would you do that? Because people don't get to have a choice to be in a program or make money, right? Like if you live in a neighborhood and live in a household that doesn't have a lot of disposable income, then it's impossible for you to make a choice to be in a program where you learn skill sets, where you learn how to love each other, where you learn to develop your spiritual tools, unless you're all also making money. So I think about um, our young people like I still remember Damian Barry, right? I still remember all of these kids. Some of them didn't make it either, right? Um, but a, a lot of them did, and Mama Paula allowed us to pay them. I think we were paying them five hundred dollars a month to, but they couldn't have any absences. Right, five hundred dollars a month to be a part of our program, and every week the organizers that had different facets of the program would sit in the circle. Mm -hmm. And we would talk about what we envisioned. And I remember, I think you always sat to my left. And ha we'd have these conversations. And you were talking then about this kind of reimagining and grounding our work and first meeting the needs of our community and letting it be community led. And so we hit it off right away. We were fast friends and close friends. And then we kind of drifted apart a little bit and I got married and had children and you had a lot of children. You already <laughs> had some, but then I you added. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I didn't see you for maybe two years. Yes. And then we ran into each other at this event at USC. Yep. And it was some kind of like peace building event. There were a bunch of celebrities though speaking. Yeah, um, it, was, um, it was the Russell Simmons event. Um, you know, when he was doing that, um, I forgot the name of the organization that Russell used to have where he was, um, they had a political platform with, with, uh, with Ben Chavis. And um, yeah. we, we were there with, I was there with, uh, with Dave uh, Mays from Source Magazine um, because Congresswoman Maxine Waters had introduced us and wanted us to help him because there was some some struggles that that, that basically Dave Mays and Russell Simmons were were having. Yeah. yeah, she still always does that. I talked with her today, mm. making sure, always making sure that we're taken care of, and you That's know, right. always asking how she can make connections. Um, well, so I don't know who you were there with. I yeah. didn't meet Dave Mays. I remember. City. I was there with, well, Dave Mays was just one of the cats, but I was there with about 50 brothers from the Jordan Downs and from the Nickerson right. Garden. I do <laughs> remember that. Yeah. I also remember that it was like we never stopped hanging out because I sat next to you and I had my new baby, Tindy Way, with me. Yeah. Yep. And it was your first time meeting her. Mm -hmm. And as we sat down and talked, you told me about your son, Terrell. That's and right. I wasn't um, 
when you told me about it, like I didn't want to put it, like I didn't want to grieve because I was feeling you because you were my friend and I didn't feel like I could grieve it. Mm -hmm. But I, it just hit me, I guess also as a new mother, can you share with the viewers um, about Terrell, what happened with him sure. and how that challenged you? Absolutely. Oh, first, I, I just want to say, you know, to Mama Paula, um, and, and she might not know this, but when I had, um, you know, we co-founded American, um, took it to multiple cities across the country. I literally lived on the road. So when I wasn't seeing you, I was living on the road with American for almost four years. And so I would dip in back and forth to LA, but I, I lived in, in, in Vegas, I lived in um, Ohio, I lived in Oregon, you know, setting up American in those different cities and, and running our program and organizing peace treaties there as well. And when I came back, um, you know, me and Jim had our necessary betrayal as mentor and mentee. And, um, you know, I say necessary betrayal because betrayal is necessary because it doesn't mean that a relationship is over. It, it actually, um, uh, means that you get to redefine the relationship and course correct. Um, and, and so um, we had our necessary betrayal and, and Mama Paula gave me my first contract outside of American, actually independent of American. Um, we, um, I had to do a letter with Jim and all types of stuff. I, I set up American CSDI um, because a, pe a lot of people knew our work as American. And so setting up the Community Self-Determination Institute was a new step forward. And, um, and Mama Paula gave us a contract for 100 grand. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so- a lot of money then. That was, uh. that, you know, absolutely. I mean, there's organizations now in the city that still don't get that type of money, you know? Right. And so forever grateful to you, sis. You know, um, and I, I love when I see you and we get an opportunity to interact. And um, I haven't had an opportunity to even to tell that story. But, um, but you know, Melina, you were, you were speaking about just, um, you know, my man, Orlin Bishop, um, who has been a, um, a mentor and, and a friend um, and, and spiritual advisor, um, has been with me at every single um, major transition and transformation in my life. Um, and um, it's, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to have him there, you know, when my son Terrell was murdered. Um, you know, in, in, in 2003, you know, um, my son, you know, graduated from high school, went to, um, he went to Bourbon Day, got a scholarship to Humboldt State University. Um, proudest day in my life, you know, checking my son in school, going to his classes with him, meeting his, uh, his dorm mates, because I knew that he was laying the foundation for his little brothers and sisters to come right behind him. He came home, you know, on winter break, and went to a party with some of his friends um, over in Ladera Heights um, and was shot to death at the party. You know, now I'm no novice to violence. As I said, I grew up in the projects. I participated in gangs. I lost many families and friend members uh, and, and friends to, to violence, but, but nothing literally ever prepares you for the loss of your child, right? And I mean, I could have did a lot of things with, with that, uh, um, in that moment, you know, um, Orlin, we talk about like how when the body dies, it releases this etheric energy um, that can be harnessed to do what we perceive as good things or bad things, right? We, um, we, we saw what happened with, the, with the, the public execution of George Floyd. His life force, his etheric energy left his body and it created a, a, um, a fissure in the world, right? 25 million people have taken to the street all over the world, you know, um, in the name of this injustice um, to call forth something, you know, new to emerge, right? For us to imagine something new, very similar to what happened to Jesus the Christ, mm. you know, an innocent man that was publicly executed, you know, in which his etheric energy entered the world. And the mystery of Golgotha is that there was an earthquake, there was a fissure that happened after his death in which the Christ consciousness entered the world so that all human beings can have access to it, right? And so when my son was murdered, I mean, I, um, you know, I'm pretty well respected in the neighborhood. So you can imagine, you know, what the homies wanted to do. It, you know, I come from a culture where an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, 
you know, and unfortunately, I'm a, it's left us all blind and toothless. Right. But still, we perpetuated this, this, um, this uh, way of life that has not served us. And so when I heard that, you know, my son's friends and, and some of my friends was talking about going on a mission, you know, to redeem Terrell or to, re you know, to, to pay respect and honor to me, you know, I went and told folks that that wasn't Terrell's legacy. Right. You know, that, um, that, that going and, and, and harming someone else and, and you know, would only, would, one, it wouldn't bring Terrell back. And then secondly, it would send another parent, you know, through this heartache and heartbreak that I was actually suffering through as a result of the loss of my child. And so I, I, I told folks that we wanted to do something much more profound with the etheric energy of Terrell, is that we, we wanted to utilize it as a way to ask a deeper question and, and engage a deeper conversation. And so I went on America's Most Wanted and I asked a young man to turn himself in. And, um, and, and I expressed compassion you know, for him because I was like, I know how it is, you know what I'm saying? In terms of some of the people that I called, you know, friend and some of my best friends, you know, um, had taken life, right? And, and so I didn't condone what he did. I mean, of course I wanted him to be held accountable for his action, but I did also recognize that this young man was a victim. He was a victim, you know, of a, of a of culture that doesn't even see him as human. He was a victim of a society that really doesn't understand like, you know, a love as a practice, right? But, but more so as an idea. And, and I hold space, you know, for, for his healing because I truly believe that, um, you know, his life is intrinsically connected to Terrell's for the rest of his. I mean, you don't take a life in the next day and you skipping and singing and dancing. I mean, you see your victim's space and dreams and imaginings and flashbacks, you know? And, and so him reconciling what he did um, will determine how he will be able to function in the world. Um, you know, I don't believe that we're our worst experiences. I don't believe that, that, that we're the things that we've done, you know, or the things that have been done to us. I, I believe that those things are only informing who we become. They don't define who we are. And, and so this, you know, this, 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 um, practice, you know, that, that I've, um, uh, you know, learned from some of the mentors in my life and primarily Orland Bishop, you know, I, I, I hold as a part of the foundation, because I was 16 years, you know, in the trenches and on the front line when this happened. Um, I hold as a part of the practice in my work. You know, one of the first things that I said after uh, I got the message that he was shot was that there is a gift in this tragedy. And I was going to look for the gift, right? Um, because where the wounds are is where the gift lie. And so, you know, on my, on my way, you know, to the murder scene and then to the hospital, you know, um, I was just saying that there's a gift in this and I'm looking for it, right? And so, um, you know, to me, you know, um, the work that I've done since then has been about making sure that Terrell's death was not in vain, you know? And that, so I've harnessed the etheric energy of Terrell and I focused that energy in, in terms of reimagining what public safety looks like in urban communities and urban war zones all across the country. Um, and, and to me, you know, it's always been that, um, and, and, and excuse my language, but the only thing in a neighborhood that niggas control is violence, unfortunately, you know? And I'm like, we could harness, you know, the, the lives lost and we can engage a whole new conversation and we can be the peacemakers and the peace givers in our respective neighborhoods. And so it was about training people um, in, 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 um, as public safety professionals teaching them conflict resolution and mediation skills, teaching them about trauma-informed approaches in CPR and somatics, um, and coupling this, you know, in, in advocacy and activism so that we can utilize it, um, not as this willy-nilly way of being able to approach violence reduction in community, but as a systematic operation, you know, um, that, that has standard operating procedures and protocols, very much like law enforcement, right, um, to provide um, a a system of services um, to be able to reduce violence and crime in our respective neighborhoods. And we've been able to do that in multiple cities across the country. Even though folks have consistently taken credit for our work, um, I feel like I've, I've been really fortunate to land in a place like, like Newark, you know? Um, you know, Newark, um, you know, if you, if you take the word, it's the new arc, you know what I'm saying? I think it's the new Selma, you know, it's the next Selma in this country, right? It's a new arc of the covenant. 
and and it's headed up by man by one of the most visionary you know um uh, progressive you know mayors in the country my man mayor rash j baraka you know I, i've known this brother for 25 years you know he's been on the front line in the trenches has has only been interested i mean he's not a politician man he is he is a human being a real person who is in politics and his only vision and goal was to become mayor of his city so that he could serve his people and so when he tapped me to come in to newark and to build out his community-based public safety initiative um it was a it was a spiritual calling that i left all of the work that we had going here in the city i mean <laughs> restaurants <laughs> foundations all different types of things to be in service to my brother and to be in service to his vision you know to have um a safe city in newark because you know if some of you guys know that newark up until four years ago um was kind of consistently over over 50 year period in the top 10 five most violent city list but now we've had four consecutive years in a row of, of, of decreases in homicides and murder in the south ward who which used to be the most violent you know neighborhood in the city last year in 2019 we had a negative 48 percent reductions in homicide um two weeks ago um the mayor introduced an ordinance to move um in the in the in the honor of george floyd um to move 10 percent, i mean five percent of the 230 million dollar um police department's budget into a new department of, of violence prevention and trauma recovery we passed that ordinance nine to zero and and to just today you know, um, some of some of the, the the key activists in the city, Keisha Yuri, um, you know, um, you know, um, you know, Sister Don, um, who runs the Brick City Peace Collective, um, you know, um, Kailisha, um, uh, uh, Wingfield Hill, um, and and the legendary um, uh, a legendary brother who is our um, our city the city historian, um, uh, Junius Williams. You know, we convene today to work on the strategy of building out this new Department of Violence Prevention um, and Trauma Recovery. And, and so it's, um, I mean, it's been just such profound work, you know. Um, we, we have been getting, you know, just invitations and, and calls from all across the country um, for people to come in and see the work that we're doing. And this is what, you know, the work that we do is about, is, is what really uh, reimagining pub sa public safety, you know, looks like. That, um you know you you can't have public safety without the public right it's like for far too long you say public safety and people say police when 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 police are only one small aspect of the public safety process you know and and so um our work has been essentially about um supporting law enforcement and having a targeted deterrent strategy on maybe that that one percent of violent crime that happens in the community but then moving and reallocating and, re and reallocating resources so that we can build infrastructure, you know, around victim services and, and support services and, uh, and healing services, um, you know, in the community, um, because that's where the majority of our dollars, you know, should be going. So, you know, um, what we've done in Newark is just the first step, you know, I mean, we're six years into a, um, into a process that, um, that, that is just beginning. And, and so, you know, I see really profound things happening as we add kind of technology to this process. Um, I mean, our goal now is in the next two to three years, um, specifically in the South Ward, is to take violence to zero, you know, because the Black community should be the safest community on the planet, straight up, you know. And, and I think that, um, not that I think, I know that we have the ability um, um, and the tools to be able to make it happen. So that's really beautiful. And you know, I always feel like a um, like a, a surrogate for the city of Newark because I'm always talking about your incredible work there. Um, I'm wondering, and you've, you've gotten to it, but I want people to get a really succinct definition of what it means to reimagine public safety. So when you say reimagine public safety, and I remember when um, Mayor Baraka was first elected, you um, brought a bunch of us out and you had this kind of reimagined public safety conference, right? Um, and it really was this very deep conversation about how do we get to the heart of things? How do we um, begin to um, think about what safety looks like and the truth of how we get there? So anyway, that's 
too long of a framing, but can you just give us a very succinct definition of what it means to reimagine public safety? So reimagining public safety means that you engage community in the public safety process. As I said, you can't have public safety without the public. So it's about training residents in a relationship-based approach to intervene in violent and crime in the community. And so for us, the Newark Community Street Team was the model that the mayor um, commissioned. Um, NCST started out as, you know, 16 independent contractors, you know, um, very like um, doing high risk intervention, safe passage and victim services. And today we're a team of over 50, you know, and, and so essentially um, we, we intervene, our high risk intervention team intervenes in individual and group conflicts, both past and present events. Um, we, we, um, uh, we, we operate with standard operating procedures and protocols. We, we show up at the murder scene. Um, we gather intelligence on the outside. We have a team that's um, embedded in the hospital. So we have a hospital. We launched the city's first hospital-based violence intervention program. We have three outreach workers who are embedded in the hospital because that's one of the key places where people go when they're harmed. Um, and, and so we, we enroll them into our program bedside. We um, then, once they're ready to go home, we, we then develop a safety plan. Because again, it's all about safety in which our high-risk intervention team works with both parties, perpetrators and victims, to uh, mediate the conflict that potentially sent them there. Um, we have a safe passage program, which I call our forward-facing initiative. Um, we employ about 21 individuals. We do safe passage at 12 schools. We make sure our kids go to school safely and they come home safely, right? And essentially, we did a study with the health department when we first launched the program, and we discovered that the majority of the violence happens in and around schools, right? It's a really difficult transitional age, you know, for, for adolescents, you know, that, that 14, that 13, 14, 15 age, you know, when they're, when they're transitioning from junior high school to high school. You know, we know that things happen in the community on the weekends and spill on the campus on Monday morning and vice versa. Things happen in, on the school and, and spill into the community, right? And so we mediate conflicts there. We provide, you know, um, you know, mentoring through a case management model to that, that same population, that 18, I mean, that 14 to 30 year old population. We, we provide hardship assistance. We provide, um, you know, um, uh, you know um, pro bono legal services to families. We, we, we support them with, um, with, um, with emergency needs, like birth certificates and IDs and social security cards. We help them to buy jackets when they don't have jackets. We help them to get haircuts when they need a haircut. We buy tennis shoes, we buy uniforms, all of those key pieces, right? And all of this work is being done by non-traditional leaders, right? And so these are ex-game members, ex-convicts, and you have to, 100% of our staff are residents of the neighborhoods in which they live, in which they serve. And so it's an opportunity also to change the image of these so-called ex-gang members and ex-convicts. Um, because at one point we saw them as the predators in the neighborhood, but now we see them as the, as the healers and the, and, and the truth bringers and the, and the problem solvers in the neighborhood, right? Um, the, the other key component is our victim services piece. Traditionally, you know, black people don't identify as victims and nor has a system ever seen us as victims, you know? But there's a fund in the state called Victims Comp that, that um, up until we launched our program, 90% of black residents who were applying for victims comp in the state were being denied. So we utilize a forum called the Public Safety Roundtable that we actually modeled after the Watch Gang Task Force. Um, it's now become the most important social forum in the city, a public policy forum in the city, in which we basically hold our elected officials accountable for services that they're providing. So we, we hold electeds, we hold law enforcement, we hold community-based organizations, faith-based groups, anybody who's supposed to be providing services in our neighborhood, we hold them accountable um, through this forum. And we utilize it as a way um, to be able to change policy. So we, we change, I want to say, two important policies that we change. One, within law enforcement, if the police, like when, when Raheem gets shot and go to the hospital, the police are there questioning him, trying to find out you know, who shot him and all this type of stuff. And if he doesn't say it, then they say that he was uncooperative. And then they'll put on the police report, victim suspect, which will automatically disqualify him from receiving victim services, you know, through the state, you know? 
um, if he dies, it automatically disqualifies the family from receiving, you know, dollars to bury their loved one. Okay. So one of the first big things that we were able to change is that we, we work with our public safety director um, in the city, Ambrose, who's, a, who's, who's just been exceptional in terms of our relationship. Um, and, um, and we were able to do an administrative change where he wrote a memo and told all of the detectives to stop putting victim suspect on the application. We later then changed the administrative law in the state um, because if you have any open warrants or, or, um, or, or you know, convictions and stuff like that, you are automatically disqualified from receiving victim's comp. And so we worked with our AG in the state and we just actually made a whole slew of changes and reforms to our victim compensation uh, and victim services um, uh, law in the state of, of New Jersey that goes into effect in, in August. And I, I have, you know, one of my, you know, good friends, E. Rupman, um, you know, to thank, and then also, you know, the attorney general himself, um, you know, uh, General Graywall, um, who has become, you know, a real ally in this work. We, we just hosted him actually this past Tuesday at our public safety roundtable. You know, he came to talk um, and speak about, um, you know, some of the changes that we made. Um, and so, you know, working, you know, with, with advocacy um, in, in organizing in this system of services, um, along with a collaboration with partners throughout the city, having a progressive mayor, you know, who really believes in this work and, and, and who is the real leader, you know, of this movement has, has, has um, just made it, um, you know, possible for us to be able to make some tremendous changes and strides in the city. And so reimagining public safety um, was about coordinating the public safety providers in the city um, and, and making sure that everybody played their lane, you know? And, and you know, again, there, there's still a tremendous amount of work um, that, that, that we have to do um, in terms of a lot of the structural violence, like kind of um, um, situations and institutions that, that, that try to keep us from working together. Um, and, 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 you know, we're working on those things. So we want to um, encourage um, our viewers on Facebook to ask questions in the comment section. Um, we'll make sure that we get those questions to Akila. Um, and as you're talking, Akila, I think that there's a couple of things that come up for me. And then there's also a few questions I want to ask you from the viewers. Um, one, I just want um, to lift up a point that you made, right? that this is not just a model that's effective in terms of um, addressing so-called crime in the neighborhood, right? Yeah. It's also um, a question of providing folks with resources because what you're doing through these street teams is providing people who are hard to employ that's right. with livable wage jobs that th give them a sense of dignity, but also yeah. provide them with an income where they can support themselves and their families. And like you said, really kind of transform the ways in which communities are, are looking at their folks, right? So right. rather than um, looking at folks who have, might've been offenders, right? So-called offenders, right? They're right. now seeing them as valuable That's to the right. community. Um, so I'm really interested in how all of that plays out. And one of the questions that was raised by our viewers is um, how is this paid for? Yes. Who's paying for this? Yeah. So, so um, great question. The residents, you know, who operate this program own this work. And so um, because of their belief in it, you know, we, we were able to, you know, initially start with the mayor earmarking, you know, dollars um, through his foundation, through our, through our major foundation partners in the city. So Prudential Foundation, Victoria Foundation, um, you know, Healthcare Foundation for New Jersey, they put up the initial dollars to see this work. And, um, and so we were able to hire, you know, individuals and pay them, you know, um, it's not a whole lot of money, but, you know, in the state of New Jersey, I think the, the, the uh, minimum wage is now about 10 bucks an hour. Um, but since we, and when we started, the minimum wage was $8.60 an hour. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? Um, but we've never paid people under $15 an hour since we started. Um, and so we were able pay, to pay people a livable wage, um, launching the project, and, um, and, and through, you know, that work, we've, we've um, really kind of diversified our funding base. 
So, you know, I, um, I have um, um, a, a small team, you know, in which we do a lot of development work. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I probably am doing, you know, uh, five to seven, you know, I'm responding to five to seven RFPs a month. Um, I'm always on the fundraising trail. We, um, we, we now have about 16 funders, um, you know, so we, we get Boca dollars through the state. Um, you know, we, we just was awarded a $1.3 million grant. Um, and remind you know, people what the VOCA dollars are. You mentioned it, but just remind them. Yeah, so VOCA is the Victims, uh, Victims of Crime Act. This is a federal, you know, um, a federal program. White Collar Crime pays dollars into this. There's billions of dollars into it. Every state gets an allocation, you know, and, and so the, 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 city, the, the state of New Jersey gets about, I don't know, somewhere about 60 to 70 million dollars a year at this particular point. Most of the time, those dollars go directly into law enforcement for victim services. But, um, but you know, the Alliance for Safety and Justice, Equal Justice USA, Common um, just, uh, um, there's an, another organization called Common Justice. They organized um, and met with the federal government and, and started getting dollars allocated to underserved victims, you know, across the country. And so we have a, a, a BOCA grant um, that, that allows us to provide services to victims. Um, we have a, a Promise Neighborhood grant with our partner, the Software Children's Alliance, um, one of our corporate partners, um, l and Developers, is one of the biggest developers in the, uh, in the state. We, we do community building in two, of, um, in two of what used to be some of the most violent like kind of neighborhoods in the city, Georgia King Village and Zion Tower. Um, so as l and is redeveloping those neighborhoods, we provide like all of the support services, you know, um, in those communities, mentoring through a case management model, victim services. Currently, we deliver like um, maybe over a thousand meals daily you know, um, to every single resident in those developments with our team, you know. Um, and, and Akila, can you just um, underscore the point, and I'm trying to get a whole bunch in in this next yeah. 12 minutes, um, but can you underscore the point that I think has been embedded throughout as we reimagine public safety, as we implement programs like the one that you're, you've developed and um, are running in Newark, um, what have we seen in terms of crime statistics? Has crime gone up or down? So crime has gone down significantly, um, as, as well as our excessive force issues with our police department because of our trauma to trust programs that we do with community and law enforcement, right? Um, we have a law enforcement that's cooperative, you know, that works with us, right? Um, we, um, and, and this is all like, you know, through, um, through strategic relationships and conversations and work you know, um, that we've done. Um, but uh, but um, the first, uh, after the first year and a half of our program, we gang homicide, I mean, homicides in the city dropped by double digits, 12%. And we followed that up every single year um, since 2016. And as I said, um, 2019 was our, um, was our biggest year yet. We had a 60 year low in terms of violence and overall crime, even aggravated assaults, which is extremely hard, you know, um, to move that needle has gone down in the city. Um, and, and this is because of this collaborative approach with multiple agencies working together and, um, and led by our mayor, because Mayor Baraka ain't no joke. <laughs> he is a total beast. And he's not, he's not about coalitions. He's about collaborations. You know, he wants to see MOUs between organizations working together. He, um, you know, and he, he makes it his business to be out in the field as well. And so it, this, you know, this working relationship um, just makes it um, powerful. You know, I mean, I just wanted to say something real quick about um, um, uh, raising resources because it's a, it's a challenge, you know, for most organizations and stuff, you know, to raise dollars. And, um, and so we, we've developed, you know, a little bit of a formula, you know, in, in how we leverage the, the, you know, the grant dollars that we get against other resources with some of our foundation partners. Like, you know, New Jersey, all, all of the all of the um, nonprofit like funders they all talk to each other, right? And so you know you you know when when one, when one sees that you're kind of like doing work great work, you know um, you ask your funder your, fun, your you know foundation partners to talk to the other funders, and this is how you kind of mix and match dollars and stuff, you know. So yeah, yeah, that that's really really great information. One of the things though that I think is shameful. Um, is that you're doing this work all the way in Newark when you are from here. You're right. from Watts. And I know that I get to 
contribute just a little bit to some of the work that you're doing in Watts with the Reverence Project. Folks are asking online, one, how they um, follow your work in Newark. Is it online somewhere that we can look at? But two, I'd also like you to add on, to build on to that, um, about some of the work that's moving uh, mostly through your daughter now, right, here in Watts. Um, and then how do we support that? So the shameful piece for me is that Los Angeles has far more in terms of resource than Newark has, right? And so it's really important that um, we think about why those dollars here in Los Angeles, you know, we're talking about, you talked about a $230 million budget for law enforcement in Newark. We have a $3.15 billion budget here in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So LA could, could fund you to do this work here in LA if they wanted to. But there's um, an issue, and I want to get off my soapbox so that we can get your voice. But it's shameful that that money is not going to you to do that work in Los Angeles. I think some of the work that's moved recently um, with our push to defund the police here and reimagine public safety is starting to bring dollars in. But what you're, um, I think, lifting up is through the real leadership of someone like a Mayor Raz Baraka. And I don't know if there's a someone like because Raz Baraka is a very um, unique and um, differently committed mayor, right? So like you said, he's a whole and complete human being who happens to be working in politics and also has a very deep and long history in black freedom struggle That's as right. the son of Amiri Baraka, right? Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Been, been in the struggle all of his life. Um, but why, so again, how can people follow your work? I know you dropped a link. We're gonna put it in the Facebook piece as well. Um, how can people follow your work in Newark and what's happening with your work here in Watts and how can we follow that and advocate to get some of what you're doing in Newark here in Los Angeles? Yes. Um, yes. So I'll share, I shared the links, you know, the Newark community street team.org, um, to learn a lot more about our work. Um, I also dropped, uh, a, um, an, um, a news story that we just had done a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and, uh, in, in addition to, um, I don't know if you guys are watch the Laura Flanders show, but there is a, a link, you know, um, for the Laura Flanders show that also kind of chronicles our work <coughs> in Newark, um, in, in LA, you know, we, um, you know, the, the reference project, which is a, a nonprofit that I started, um, you know, some, um, you know, wow, it's been almost, uh, almost 15 years ago is now being headed up by my daughter, Oya Shirelles. We, um, we also have a VOCA grant in the state. We also are funded through CalVIP. Um, we, a couple of the projects that we're doing in partnership with organizations like PCITI, the Professional Community Intervention Training Institute with Akil Bashir. Akil actually trains all of our people in, in Newark, New Jersey. Um, and, uh, and we're so fortunate to have that brother. The brother is just a genius um, in, in terms of this work. He, he trains like, you know, um, I would say, you know, is one of the best trainers in terms of standard operating procedures and protocols in terms of community-based intervention um, in, in the country, straight up, you know. Um, um, his system is, is, is the one, right? Um, we, we are currently operating the, the next generation of, of community-based intervention program. It's called the Community Sentinels Program. Um, we're on our first cohort. I think we're getting ready to have a graduation um, in, in two weeks um, from that in which we're basically teaching young folks in the community um, about civic education and public safety policy um, and, um, and organizing and activism. And so we, we bring in speakers and leaders over a period of 10, uh, 10 weeks. We show videos and documentaries because we feel like um, we need to have sentinels in the community, not just interventionists, you know, to call and be able to intervene. But every resident in the neighborhood should understand public safety policy and civic education. They took civics out of the school. So most folks don't even know how, what the role of the mayor is, the district attorney, a, a, a congresswoman, Maxine Waters. I mean, because I know I didn't, 
I didn't know that the that the that the that Congress actually allocates dollars, you know, to um, to uh, to city uh, to state and city municipalities to be allocated. I didn't know that she oversaw the CDBG community development block grant money. I mean, these are things that you don't know if you don't if you're not you know um, understanding and engaged in civics. And so we try to educate that next generation. The other piece that we do is around healing. Um, because our communities have been war zones and we understand violence as a public health issue, um, that we have to address the high levels of trauma, of, of, of traumatic stress, hypervigilance, and vicarious trauma that exists in our people. It's hard for us to even access a job or get a job and keep a job unless we address the underlying trauma, you know, that's been allowed to fester and ripple, you know, throughout our community. So, you know, for a number of years, we've, um, we, I mean, we're currently hosting healing circles. We take people on, on, on spa journeys. Um, you know, they close the spa, you know, we spa, we, we, you know, we do um, touch therapy, somatic therapy. Um, we're in the process of building a comprehensive wellness center um, at our site at 1673 East 103rd Street in Watts. Um, and so being able to support that work, I mean, it's, I mean, I, I would, really invite partners um, to, to, to invest in, in helping us to develop um, our, our alternative healing center in Watts. Because um, when, when you think about therapy um, in, in the traditional sense, nowadays when you go to the doctor and you're having an emotional or psychological break, I mean, they're misdiagnosing you and they're giving you an option to take some drugs. You know, so now we have an opioid crisis because people are being given psychotropics, um, people are being given over, I mean, you know, um, over prescribed, like extremely strong, um, um, you know, painkillers and stuff or common colds and stuff and everything. And it's got our whole community hooked on drugs. And, and it's these, these, these medications that they're distributing now, they alter behavior and personality forever, you know? So we have to be careful about what we're taking. And, and Melina, if I could just say, um, you know, that that one of the one of the things that that I think that in, in in the city of Los Angeles, in terms of redefining public safety, that we haven't done, is that grid, right? Um, which is totally uh, is grossly underfunded. Twenty three cities, I mean, twenty three neighborhoods across the city. The city basically appropriates the 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 black intellectual capital and the Latino intellectual capital in in terms of those organizations um, through grid. And they've set up this bureaucracy that is so difficult now to access the money that only big organizations that have huge fiscal capacity can actually access the dollars. And the grid, the program is under, it's called the Game Reduction Youth Development Program. They should set up a whole new department that is actually connected to public safety in the city because the Game Reduction Youth Development Program has 10 years of data showing that they actually reduce violence and crime without police. It's one of the best systems in the country, okay? Right. And it's like, it's ridiculous that this data is buried on page 18. You know what I'm saying? Um, because the law enforcement lobby is so powerful in the city of Los Angeles that it absorbs all of the money and it, and it sees itself as in competition with, with, um, with community-based violence um, 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 interventionists. And so I would say that we need to move the gang reduction youth development program out of youth development underneath violence prevention, create its own department and allocate about $200 million to that department alone. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's, it's like, it would be revolutionary. And I would say it would be comparable to what the mayor has done um, in Newark um, that needs to be done in LA. Ashe, Ashe, indeed. So we are right up at eight o'clock and I had a lot more that I wanted to ask you, but we've run out of time. I want to lift up that we will see you again on Saturday morning because we're going to be talking about, um, and Akilah's still on the line, we're going to be talking about reimagining public safety. We have some things that are moving um, that are really grounded in the incredible work that Akilah has done, um, that we've tried to build from as Black Lives Matter Los Angeles. Um, and we have a motion that was introduced by city council member Herb Wesson and supported by other members of city council that will move um, away from police responses to nonviolent emergency calls. And we really want to 
Think about models like Newark. Think about these um, street teams that um, Akila was lifting up. And so he's going to be with us to kind of frame that on Saturday morning in Norman Houston Park. We'll have snacks for everybody. Um, we'll practice physical distancing. We'll have masks if you need them. But please come and help vision um, how we can move this forward. Engage in your radical imagination. And Akila is going to be part of, part of that conversation. Again, Saturday morning at 10 a.m. in Norman Houston Park, Akila will be there to help frame it. We'll have incredible peace builders from Los Angeles, like Gilbert Johnson from Community Coalition. Um, I'll be there. Um, lots of folks from neighborhoods will be there, from surrounding neighborhoods will be there. So please come out and help us. Like Akila said, you can't have a reimagined view of public safety without the public. We are the public. Help us build what we can, um, help us build our most radical imaginings in this space. Mm. Um, so Akila, do you have any last words before we log off? We're about two minutes over time, but I just love you and you know I, um, really, really love the work that you're doing. Anybody who wants to see the flyer again can always go to our social media pages. Instagram is BLM Los Angeles. Twitter is BLM LA. And you're already on our Facebook page, Black Lives Matter Los Angeles. Last words, Akila. Yes, I just want to lift up you, you know, my sister queen in the fabulous work that you do. I'm like, I'm talking about you everywhere all the time. This morning, I was talking with a group of youth in, uh, in, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, on a, on a similar um, uh, uh, you know, Zoom call. And I just wanna say, I'm just so um, humbled to be you know, working with you and for you. And as I shared with you just a couple of weeks ago, you know, I follow you to the Zoom moon, sis, and we'll go to war for you, you know? And so I just love you so much, Melina, and, um, and, and just, you know, thank you for, for what you do for us. Thank you for what you do for us. And I will see you tomorrow and the next day. Yes, you will. <laughs> okay. Love you so much. Love you too. All right. Bye. Peace, everybody. Please tune in again next week for This Is Not a Drill. No.